if you saw our recent video on the Victorian workhouse, and if you didn't, you can see it here. But if you did, you'll note that we made a case that the workhouse is not necessarily as bad as you think it is. And today we're looking at another type of poverty accommodation, the common lodging house or DOS house. And let me tell you, these are as bad as you think they are, in many cases worse. Now to give you a bit of background, at the height of the Victorian period, the change in the country's population and demographic had been massive. The Industrial Revolution had seen employment opportunities move from the rural landscape to the cities, which had the effect of tripling London's population. And this massive increase in population brought with it its own problems. There were just more people than jobs. Even with all the factories, the docks, the Victorian building and engineering projects, there just wasn't enough work to go around. And that meant far from making your fortune, if you applied the Victorian values of hard work and good character, you'd barely scrape by with a living. Secondly, with that much competition for labour in the area, it just drives down the wages of the workforce lower and lower, which in turn creates a class of employed poor. And with people being unable to afford the basic rent of a reasonable, if somewhat shabby dwelling, and the only homelessness relief being the workhouse casual wards, there was a mass of people who were employed, some steadily, some not so steadily, but still homeless. These people couldn't use the workhouse casual wards because that would require them being absent from their jobs, the casual ward requiring a day's work in exchange for your stay. So for these people, along with many new arrivals, immigrants and other destitute people, temporary shelter could be sought in the many common lodging houses, DOS houses, KIP houses or four penny hotels within London and frankly all other cities in the UK. While this was paid accommodation, in reality it offered little more than the charitable shelter or the workhouse casual ward, but in their defence they didn't expect you to work for the following day or attend some form of religious service in return for accommodation. You paid and they didn't ask questions, and it suited most people who were involved. Fourpence bought you a bed for the night. Well, not necessarily for the night, but for the portion of the day that you needed it. The most enterprising of lodging housekeepers could get a shift pattern going and keep a bed occupied throughout a full 24 hours by rotation through three to four people. Beds range from actual iron bedsteads at the top end of the scale to down to the more common simple wooden box or four penny coffin as they were known. And these will be packed into the space available to cram as many in as possible. The more beds, the more pennies, even if it meant less comfort. Very much the Victorian way. Journalist and social reform campaigner Henry Mayhew referred to this when he wrote London Labour and the London Poor in 1851, his review of London poverty. In it he said it is by no means unusual to find 18 or 20 in one small room, the heat and horrid smell from which are insufferable. And that was if you could afford the fourpence. If you couldn't, well then there were options. For twopence you could sort yourself out with a two penny hangover for the night. Now these were actually started by the Salvation Army of all people, but never want to miss extra pennies for space where you couldn't fit a bed, the lodging house proprietor knew a good idea when he saw one. The two penny hangover is one of the most bizarre forms of accommodation we're ever likely to come across. Basically, you slump over a rope that goes along a long bench. It's not remotely comfortable and I can't imagine how tired you would need to be in order to do this. And seriously, I'm not making this up. George Orwell lived as a vagrant in both London and Paris while researching his book for Down and Out in Paris and London. And he wrote of these. At the two-penny hangover, the lodgers sit in a row on a bench. There is a rope in front of them and they lean on this as though leaning over a fence. A man humorously called the valet cuts the rope at five in the morning. And then the homeless are kicked out onto the streets again. It sounds harsh, doesn't it? And it is. But it's not as harsh as the one-penny option. The penny sit-up. It's all the luxury of the two-penny hangover, but without the rope or any permission to sleep. For one penny... You could sit on the bench, but you were not allowed to sleep, and people would be watching to make sure that people were not sleeping without paying the two pence for the penny hangover. By today's standards, these methods are callous and woefully inadequate. However, at the time, this sort of com accommodation was being offered by charities as well as landlords. These are the homeless shelters of 150 years ago. 
It's hard to get reliable statistics on the number of DOS houses operating in the UK throughout the Victorian period. Even when registration was a legal requirement in, after 1851, you only had to register as an owner. You didn't have to register the actual premises, so many of those were not necessarily disclosed. Later history books have put the number as high as 1,400 registered houses in London alone with a further 3,200 which have been identified as unregistered. That's over 4,500 houses, and they sheltered an estimated 80,000 people. That's a quarter of the official population of London at the 1861 census. Now, I'll agree, not everybody in London is going to be caught by the census, but that should give you an idea of the poverty levels going on here. Thankfully, both accommodations and homelessness support has moved on considerably in this day and age, with both government and charity sector working to address the causes of homelessness rather than reform the character of the person. Whether they get it right or not is not for us to comment. After all, we here do history, not current affairs. But it is worth noting that the high housing costs in America are starting to see lodging houses reappear in places like San Francisco. I just hope they're of a higher standard. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.